Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrus. Today we're joined by Fleming Rose. He's a journalist and author of The Tyranny of Silence. So there's a new – there's a paperback edition of The Tyranny of Silence coming out next year and it's got a new chapter on the Charlie Hebdo killings. And in that chapter, you mention a rather chilling fact that your name appears on al-Qaeda's most wanted list of individuals guilty of offending Muhammad. So maybe start by just the story of how you ended up on such a list. <laughs> well, um, I ended up on that list uh, after being responsible for the publication of 12 cartoons um, depicting the Prophet Muhammad in the fall of 2005. They were published in? They were published in uh, Jyllandsposten, uh, the paper where I work. Um, I'm soon leaving uh, my post to become a full-time free speech advocate, writer, speaker and uh, debater. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, I mean that list was created I think a while ago. In fact, I had – forgotten about it and I also think that the Danish police had forgotten about it for a while but it, refer it resurfaced after the, um, the attack on, on, uh, on Charlie Hebdo. There were 11 people on that list, uh, three Danes among them, two of my colleagues at the paper and I and uh, one French, uh, uh, Stephanie Chabonnier. Sharp, uh, the editor in chief, uh, who was killed, and they crossed out his name on that, you know, like a most wanted list uh, in uh, in in the U.S. and said, you know, now there are only ten people left, and and that list was um, was uh, behind an imam in Yemen from Al Qaeda or the Islamic State who uh, praised the killings in uh, Paris and said, you know, we helped these guys to. Uh, commit this uh, great act, uh, and and then the list of the um, the, the ten people uh, who are still in this, that list was um, in the background, and in fact, at the time I was um, I was asked by Danish TV to uh, <laughs> to come on the air to uh, to comment on it, and I said no, thank you. <laughs> I mean, what what am, what am I supposed to say? Uh, and I. You know, they, they they wanted to play it and I said, well, every, every time you uh, air that uh, list, uh, you will just um, increase the threat uh, against me. Uh, it's up to you. I'm not uh, giving you any, any advice but I'm not going to be in the studio uh, commenting on, uh, on, on that list. So that's, uh, that's the background. When you published the cartoons, did you expect this? No, of course not. Nobody did. Even, even experts on Islam – in Denmark, uh, a, f a well-known uh, Danish expert on Islam who was very critical of the publication of the cartoon said in the fall of 2005, this is never going to be a big international issue. Two months later, everything exploded uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. It was – I mean I didn't even know, you know how sensitive uh, uh, depictions of uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, is to many Muslims. Um, but 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 uh, there's some way to go from that to start killing people and and uh, committing terrorist at attacks and, and things like that, and I I think I think it was a coincidence of many factors that you have you have uh, interests of authoritarian regimes in the Islamic world coinciding with in the interest of the imams in Denmark who wanted to take this case to the international uh, Muslim public opinion and to turn it against Denmark and the newspaper. And, and unfortunately, um, uh, it was very you know, opportune for some of these regimes in the Middle East, especially uh, the Mubarak government in Egypt, uh, the Fatah government in the, um, in the Palestinian territories, the Pakistani government, uh, imams in Saudi Arabia to exploit this issue for their own ends. Um, so it was not, you know, it was it was not written somewhere by you know that that, that this case was determined from the outset to become a big international um, uh, controversy. But you knew, but you knew there was. 
the, the around the publication of the cartoons. Can you talk a little bit about, about why you published them at that time? What was the discussion? So you knew they're you were doing something a little provocative, uh, or at least a lot <laughs> well, provocative. Yeah, well, I, I do that every day as an editor, <laughs> so, uh, and, and uh, most of it goes unnoticed. Uh, I mean, that's the job of a newspaper editor and get try to challenge your audience. Um, uh, no, but uh, of course, the cartoons didn't come out of the blue. Um, in the uh, in the fall of two thousand and five, well, early fall, August, beginning of September, there was a big news story in the Danish press about a children's book um, about the life of the Prophet Muhammad, and the writer said, "You know, I wrote this book, but I cannot find an illustrator." Uh, and I have offered the job to several illustrators and they said no thank you because they were afraid. And the one who finally said yes insisted on anonymity due to fear for his life. Um, and um, he later admitted, uh, the illustrator, that, that in fact was the case, that he was afraid. And this was a front page news story in uh, in, in in Denmark. And, and at the time, you know, we did the usual reporting we called the Association of uh, Painters, the Association of Illustrators, the Association of Writers uh, to ask, you know, is there self-censorship? Uh, what do you think about this? Uh, is it a good thing, a bad thing? Uh, and that was the first round of the coverage of this story. And then we had a follow-up uh, discussion, you know, can we do anything more on this story? And, uh, and, and somebody came up with uh, – with the proposal, why don't we ask um, illustrators in Denmark to uh, draw the profit so we can find out if there is self-censorship um, or not? So, so uh, I would say, you know, back then, back then I was trying to pose a challenge that would answer two questions. One was, is there self-censorship when it comes to Islam? Are people in cultural life uh, in Denmark and uh, probably Western Europe uh, making a difference when it comes to Islam? Um, do they treat Islam in a different way than they treat Christianity, uh, Judaism, uh, Hinduism uh, and also non-religious um, ideas? Uh, and if uh, there is self-censorship, is that self-censorship just – you know, a product of uh, people's fantasy? Uh, is it something that they make up? Uh, they just think that something might happen? Or is this self-censorship based in real fear? Um, and 10 years later, uh, we have to admit that the answer to both questions is yes. There is self-censorship and the self-censorship is based in real fear because people have been killed. And I have to live with security in Denmark, uh, you know, just for being the editor um, behind this uh, initiative. But so a lot of people have responded to the publication of these cartoons and similar occurrences with saying first, you know, you should have known what would happen or at least had an idea that this was more dangerous and not a particularly good idea. But also that even if – and we can all admit – Shooting people because they published cartoons is not acceptable. Um, but even with that, there's still something morally wrong with publishing things that you know are going to be profoundly offensive to a subset of people. That you know, I mean, obviously, someone in order to kill because you were offended, you have to have been offended fairly deeply. Mm -hmm. Well, that's like uh, John Carrier has said there is a difference between the attack on Charlie Hebdo and the one uh, November 13th in, in Paris and I don't think so. I mean Charlie Hebdo, yes, uh, people were offended by some of their cartoons but they were perfectly well in the limits of uh, French law uh, within French tradition and they did not take exception with Islam. They offend all religions and, and uh, politicians. So uh, I think that is a flawed argument um, and it also it is also a rationalization after the fact. In fact, I didn't know. We didn't know how, you know, offensive this was for too many Muslims. Um, but I also think it was exploited. Yes, I mean, every time I turn on my TV, I'm offended. 
I'm deeply offended by a lot of what I see, reality TV and uh, Donald Trump or whatever it is. Uh, it's very offensive. But, uh, you know, I don't, I don't try to, um, to, to get these um, shows banned. And I don't threaten to uh, kill people if uh, they appear on these shows. And that's a big difference. I mean, uh, the the uh, the um, the price you have to pay for living in a liberal democracy and enjoying all the benefits of it is that from time to time you may be offended by what other people say. And uh, I didn't, you know, that's one of the reasons why I I think the way I do about these issues because I didn't know about all the taboos within Islam uh, when it comes to depicting uh, the prophet. I think now a lot of people know. <laughs> but there there are 10,000 religions in the world, 10,000 religions. Am I obliged to know every taboo of every religion in the world and obey it, not to offend what is sensitive to people? I think it's uh, it's impossible for an individual to to know everything, and and it, and then it boils down to you are go- only going to take you know into consideration the taboos that uh, that makes it difficult for you, because people re- react in a violent and threatening way. That's very undemocratic. Uh, it's uh, it's um, it's you know the assassin's veto. As uh, Timothy Garden Ash put it in uh, in in the New York Review of Books, uh, and I, I think that's 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 not fair, um, and um, and I also think if you go back to to uh, to the cartoons, that in fact many people you know never saw, maybe except for one, but there were twelve cartoons, and if you look at them and you compare them to other religious satire in Denmark and Western Europe. They are very innocent uh, in, in, in many ways. They do not in any way transgress, you know, the limits for what we usually do when it comes to religious satire. So, so, so I would make the point that, that by publishing those cartoons, we were not asking more of Muslims. We were not asking less. But we were asking exactly the same of Muslims as we do of any other group uh, religious, non-religious, and 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 in that lies a fact of recognition of the Muslim community as an integrated part of our society, and that's why I, from time to time, maybe a little bit provocatively, you know, call the publication of the cartoons an integration project, uh, because we integrated the Muslim community into uh, the tradition of religious satire. Uh, of Denmark that has existed for you know several centuries. Um, uh, so so um, uh, no, I think I think I think f- first it was perfectly within the limits of the way we usually do this, and and in a multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious society, it is impossible to know the sensitivities of any of 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 every group and individual. And if you want to be consistent in applying, you know, the principle do not offend, it will lead to the title of my book, A Tyranny of Silence. Now, you write about in the book that there is nothing in Islamic law per se. I mean, I'm sure there's huge scholarly debates yes. that, that actually prohibits, first of all, non-Muslims from making representations of the prophet. But even – you write that uh, until recently, people could buy posters of a young Muhammad in Iran. Uh, and so, and so, this is somewhat new in the sense. First of all, enforcing Muslim law or or pretending that you are enforcing Muslim law on non-Muslim countries, yes. um, I'm, you know, I'm, even I'm, within I'm, Muslim countries. Yeah, I'm I'm quoting the preeminent scholar of uh, of of Islamic art, uh, Aliyek Grabar, who unfortunately passed away not long ago. Uh, a French expert on uh, on Islamic art, and he makes the point that the, 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 there is no dogma, there is nothing in the Quran that 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 uh, prohibits uh, images of the Prophet, and and uh, w- uh, even less so within Shia Islam. That's why you can buy those posters in Iran, or at least you could do it until maybe ten years ago. 
but also within Sunni Islam. I mean, in 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 Copenhagen where I live, there is a uh, a museum where we have uh, 13 or 14 century images of the Prophet. Uh, so it is a, a, a recent phenomena, and 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 much of this is based on lack of knowledge. Um, it is true that uh, that if you go into a mosque, you will not see images, uh, and 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 they have a more, you know. Geometric type of art. Yes, yeah. yes. In, in in a church, you will see paintings on the walls and and things like that. Uh, so that is a difference. But it's not that that you never had that within Islam. It, it's it's been uh, an evolving uh, tradition, uh, and it hasn't been the same way forever. How did your time in the Soviet Union? Because there was a period where you worked for. Fourteen years, I think it was in the Soviet yeah, Union. No, I spent well. I spent eleven years in the Soviet Union and Russia. How did that uh, teach you about free speech? Well, it taught me a lot. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I my wife is from the former Soviet Union. I met her when I started there in 1980 and 81, at the height of the Cold War. Um, when I came back, I started working for the Danish Refugee Council. Uh, as an interpreter, uh, so I, I was in fact working with refugees from the Soviet Union, um, and among them uh, dissidents, and um, and and that was a defining experience. I would say um, uh, I got very much, in, you know, involved. Um, I, I I traveled with. Um, Banned literature, uh, brought it into my friends, uh, brought letters back from them to uh, to, to Europe. So I, I I very much identified with their course, and 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 I learned, you know, the how bad it is for a society to um, to have censorship and especially self censorship, because in a way you had censorship in the Soviet Union, but 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 but. But for most of the time, uh, I mean, people knew in advance what the limits were. So they internalized, you know, the kind of intimidated public uh, sphere. So they would never, uh, you know, go beyond what they knew were the borders, even though they were not necessarily stipulated within the law. Um, and, and that was very... Um, you know, in it, in it, it, it was very bad for uh, society, and uh, and and it was uh, a, a fear society. Uh, you know, people were afraid. Um, they were not. Um, they were not. Uh, they dared not uh, speak their mind. Uh, only in kitchens uh, at home, uh, they were very suspicious uh, of people they would meet in the public space if they didn't know it. Uh, and all these things made a huge uh, uh, impression on me. I mean, I grew up in Denmark, uh, a quiet, uh, peaceful, uh, relatively liberal uh, country. Uh, suddenly, I am in the Soviet Union in a totalitarian system that is very oppressive, where people are being sent to labor camps for, you know, saying quite innocent uh, things. So, so I, I very much identified with uh, the cause of uh, of of the dissidents, and it 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 was the um, you know I understood late, later because people asked me why why was it so important for you to to defend these cartoons um, uh, because I realized that a lot of Danes w- were not willing to do that. Uh, so, so I I understood that 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 forming experience uh, in the Soviet Union and and Russia and my work in the Danish Refugee Council, in fact, played a very important role. How did Danes respond to to the public? Because they were divided, pretty fifty fifty. Yes, were you yes, were 50/50. you upset by you didn't get an outpouring of support? Uh, from I, I was surprised. I was surprised. I you know I mean th- th- there was a narrative that. That had to do with you know this is racist, this is bigotry. Uh, one shouldn't offend a weak, marginalized uh, minority. But that's not the way I looked at it. I mean, I'm married to an immigrant myself. Uh, I don't see myself as a bigot uh, in any way. I I lived abroad in 
Um, so I'm used to to live side by side with people uh, from other cultures, uh, belonging to other religions, and and so on and so forth. But 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 that was a very dominating narrative in Denmark at the time, and it still is somehow. Uh, but I you know I I I came back to Denmark from Russia in 2004, so I had only been in the country for one year, and I hadn't I I left in 1990. So I hadn't been part of that debate about uh, integration, immigration, Islam. Uh, that was all new to me. Uh, but I, I, I was very surprised that so many people didn't get my point. Uh, uh, but, but, but I would say, you know, 10 years after the fact, uh, the situation is different. Uh, Better or worse? Well, uh, both. <laughs> no, but it's in. Um, uh, I'm not being seen anymore as a marginal, you know, um, bigoted figure. Uh, I'm. I'm. I think more and more people have come to understood that I had a point, and I'm basically, you know, making an argument from a um, liberal, in the European sense of the word. Uh, position uh, that I'm not out to get, you know, any minorities, that this is about fundamental pr principles of a free society. And that is what I'm defending. Um, uh, I mean, just just to give you a few figures, in, um, in the spring of 2006, right after the crisis, less than 50 percent of the Danes uh, thought that it was the right thing to do to publish the cartoons. I think it 45, 46, 47 percent. Today, that figure is somewhere between 60 and 70 percent. So, you know, it's an increase of more than 25 uh, percent, 20, 25 percent. It's almost a constitutional majority that, that now believe that uh, it was the right thing to do. Um, so in that sense, I'm, I have become more mainstream in Denmark. And I also think it's because it's very difficult to make the case today that it was some, just some kind of, 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 of cheap, cheap stunt. We see what is going on in Europe, that, that we have a problem, we have to deal with it. Um, and I think that's also why the cartoons won't go away. I mean, they, they, they keep coming back because all the issues are focused in the debate about the cartoons. So in that sense, a lot of things have moved and I have, I have, I have in fact uh, been awarded uh, you know, several prizes in Denmark uh, for my work. Uh, um, at the same time, um, uh, around the anniversary of the 10th anniversary of the publication of the cartoons in September 2015, uh, uh, Va the vast majority of the Danes also think that we should not publish them again. So you have, you know, uh, almost 70 percent believe that it was the right thing to do, but only 25 percent think that we should do it again. How does that connect? It connects in the way that uh, it has to do with fear. People are afraid of what might happen if we do it again. So don't challenge fa uh, fate. <laughs> I'm curious about the – it's notable that you published cartoons and that elicited this violent reaction and it elicited the condemnation of a lot of people who didn't think that violence was the right answer. And then the Charlie Hebdo was about cartoons and it feels like there's a – there's this divide between maybe we think that humor and cartoons are a lesser form of speech. You know, They're the kind of thing like you just shouldn't do that. But you know, we don't see – well, first off, we don't see violence against, say, the publishers of Christopher Hitchens' books or Richard Dawkins' books who are far more condescending towards Islam than these cartoons were. Um, and so we don't see violence against that but we also don't see the kind of public like, oh, you shouldn't be doing this and it's – you know, you kind of deserved what you got attitude. So is it – is there something about satire or humor that makes it an easy – I mean obviously part of it is – the cartoons are pictures and so if you can't read the language, then you can still see the offense in those but you're not going to pick up a book. Um, but is there something more to it than that, that it's about cartoons and not about prose? No, I think you are getting at you know, what I intended to say, that it's, uh, 
it's the power of images. Uh, and that's, you know, I was, I was surprised about, you know, the strong reaction to the cartoon. So I, I, I started studying, uh, you know, the theory of images. Uh, and I found out that uh, that is also you, – you, originally in the, in the Bible, you also had an, a, a ban on images of God. The great, it was the no second images, amendment. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, second uh, commandment. <laughs> commandment, sorry. Not amendment. Yeah, that's another thing. <laughs> <laughs> right and keep their arms. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, so, so um, you know, images are powerful in the sense that they are open for interpretation. And 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 you had the iconoclasts also, you know, that destroyed images, uh, and and you can read into them, you know, almost whatever you you want, and 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 they get a life of their own, um, because there was also a discussion you know, about how how should we in, interpret the cartoon of the prophet with a bomb in his turban, and some people say, well, this says that the prophet is terrorist. This says that all Muslims are terrorists, while I believe that it was basically saying some people are committing violence in the name of the prophet. And that's a fact. I mean, we know. Uh, but, but, but you have all these different interpretations. Uh, so, so I think it has to do with the power of images. But it has also to do with, um, with, with the lack of of a tradition of religious satire when it comes to Islam, at least dealing with the prophet. Um, uh, we, we, we take it for granted now in the West. But if you go back in Western history, uh, you, can, you can say that, that, that the history of religious satire in the West is a, a story about our liberation from the gods or liberation from – uh, the gods exercising social control and power. Uh, religion was being used to, uh, you know, intimidate, uh, to control, to oppress, uh, and and the fight against that was, uh, in many ways, um, um, done uh, through religious satire. Uh, you don't have that in Islam, and um, and uh, you know. I th there is a very interesting story about this. Um, um, I have a good friend who is uh, who was born in Egypt and who used to be a member of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. His father was an imam in Egypt, uh, and he came to Germany, I think, in 1995 to study um, uh, religion. And uh, he had a Catholic friend, uh, German who one day told him a very dirty joke about the Virgin Maria, the most sacred figure for any Catholic. And Hamid, uh, that's his name, he was just shocked. How, how, how can you tell a joke about what is most sacred to you and even laugh at it yourself? And, and, it, he, he, and, and he was so shocked that he broke off relations with uh, this good friend because he was afraid, you know, will he ask me to tell a joke about Muhammad? Will he himself tell a joke about Muhammad at some time? So he went into, you know, he got more and more radicalized. Uh, and, and then you had the cartoon crisis uh, in Denmark and you had Charlie Hebdo and he started reading about the history of religious satire. And, and he understood, you know, that, that, uh, that this tradition of satire in, uh, in the West has – has created the conditions for a more free relationship uh, with God, that, that, uh, that religion is not being used to exercise social control and oppress people, but people have a relationship with their God that is based on a free choice. And, and the tradition of satire has been very important in paving the way for this. And, and that's why, you know, he said, well, we need more Charlie Hebdo's in the Muslim world. We need more Muhammad cartoons. And you have people who are saying, well, we should, we should not touch Muhammad because that's the only thing hundreds of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people have in the Muslim world. And I turn that around and say, well, maybe the only reason why they only have Muhammad is because they have not touched him. Uh, 
because our tradition of religious satire and criticism of religion is part and parcel of our tradition of uh, freedom and of our ability to uh, build competitive societies. But you can challenge authority and ask critical questions. Do you, do you think that possibly allowing religious satire can help strengthen religion in some way? Or, or, or Absolutely. In, yes. Because people take it as it would say. Yeah, we, we, we have just forgotten because some people say to me, well, your argument about uh, defending uh, religious satire is very abstract. Uh, you know, we, what, what, we, what we need is to fight for um, – the right to scientific inquiry and things like that. Uh, we we just forgotten how how important a role religious satire played in in this struggle for freedom in uh, in in the West, and you can see it if you look at the Muslim world. But the Muslim world is probably more. I mean, religious belief is not very strong in Western Europe right now, and the Muslim world is probably more. It, it might be very hard to quantify, say how many people That's, actually that, believe. That is true, but if so, you talk to to devout Christians in the West, uh, you know many of them would be able to laugh at a joke about Jesus. You would see. You know, no. I, I don't. You would see very few Muslims being able to laugh at a joke about Muhammad, because it's taboo. But we used to. We did have very until very recently, and I imagine they're probably still on the books in some uh, even states, but are not enforced. Blasphemy laws uh, used to be quite common. I mean, Christendom used to be fairly controlling of speech. Yes, exactly. I mean, burning people at the stake during the yes. Thirty Years' War was a huge problem. Uh, what? You write in the book about an exhibit at the Tate Modern where yeah. the otters had shredded a Quran, a yes. Bible in the Talmud yeah. mm -hmm. and they said, well, we might have a problem because of the shredded Quran. But no one said we might have a problem because of the shredded Bible or the shredded Talmud. No one really cared about that. What happened to, in your theory for to Christianity? We, we, uh, we insisted on keeping on criticizing, ridiculing, mocking uh, uh, Christianity. Um, and as I say, it, it, it doesn't mean that, that, that uh, yes, there are fewer maybe believers in, in Western Europe, but there are still a lot of believers uh, who are devout Christians. But they, 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 have, they are used to the fact that uh, their faith may be ridiculed and criticized and uh, being the target of, of satire. Uh, it doesn't make them less religious. Uh, they may be offended if it's a bad joke, uh, but they may also be able to laugh at it. Um, but but I think more importantly, it it has it 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 has meant that religion is not being used to exercise power and control in the same way as it used to be. And I, I really do believe that if you go back to uh, Dante. Uh, if you go back to Erasmus of Rotterdam, uh, to Goethe and Schiller and in our time, Monty Python, uh, <laughs> Mr. Bean or uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, it, it seems, you know, just like entertainment and it, and it is in a way. But it's, it's, it, 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 it had a very uh, profound, I think, influence on, on our way at looking at these things and, and it's lacking in – in, in big parts of the Muslim world. Well, it's striking how much it's not just – I mean so the Muslims are upset and are offended by this. But even – but many Westerners seem to be maybe increasingly opposed to free speech and there – it certainly isn't religious. Um, it's – I mean many of them, especially like in American college campuses, religion is not that dominant. But there's this notion that – you know there are minorities, historically oppressed people who are harmed by saying things that might offend them or challenging their views, um, and and that maybe we shouldn't have that absolute freedom that we're you know we're abusing it and it's okay to scale it back. Um, so outside of the Muslim world, this seems to be a a move back in the other direction, that we learned our lessons from the Western religions but now we seem to be forgetting them. Well, I think – I mean there's nothing new in this but I, I think it's, it's about identity politics. 
that um, that that we live in a you know in a globalized world. We are exposed to a lot of information. It's very difficult to answer questions like "Who am I?" Um, it's not that easy. Uh, um, so, so, so it's it's the challenge of modernity and post-modernity that you don't have a fixed, you know, you're, you're not born into a family that very early determined you're going to be this and that. You have to invent yourself, and I think that's great because with that comes freedom of choice. You can do whatever you want, uh, but it's also a challenge in the way that uh, it makes it difficult for many people to answer the question, "Who am I?" Well, we have, uh, and 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 um, and um, um, it 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 means that more and more people want to have an you know an identity and protect that identity against criticism. So you have this tribalization or ghettoization of society where we are more focused on what makes us different from one another than what we share as human beings. And in fact, we share far more than, uh, than divides us. Uh, I mean, we have more, the same genes, yeah? We have the same capabilities. Uh, um, so I, I, think, I think, you know, when we have this discussion, we, sh- we should try to focus uh, what we share as human beings uh, and, not, uh, and not try to pretend that if you are a different color or – or from a different part of the world, that you are just so different that uh, it's unable to make any comparisons with uh, human beings uh, in other places of the world. Um, This seems to fit in an interesting way with the distinction that you make between – so we we say like you know, there are laws against say Holocaust denial in a lot of Europe and there's laws against anti-Semitic speech. Um, and you draw a distinction where you say that there's a difference between attacking or criticizing ideas, um, which the say the cartoons about Muhammad are, and attacking individuals, which is what the anti-Semitic speech is. But is that complicated by this notion of people setting out to construct identity because they're they're constructing their identity by taking by internalizing sets of ideas, and then they see it as you know when you criticize these ideas that they hold dear. You're not just attacking the ideas, but you're attacking the holders of those ideas at a personal level as well. Yes, uh, I mean a, a couple of points. Um, uh, there are uh, laws against Holocaust denial within 13 member states of the European Union out of 28, and the new Commissioner uh, for Justice and Home Affairs within the European Union, uh, a Czech lady is in fact now pushing for implementation and passing of these laws in all member states. And we will also see a toughening of hate speech laws uh, against, you know, xenophobic speech and and so on and so forth. Um, So, so, but, but, uh, but, and, 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 and and then you have, um, then you have the debate about Islam. And uh, you know there are people who are comparing these things and saying yes, uh, well, um, uh, uh, for a Muslim, it is as offensive uh, to attack the Prophet as it is to a Jew to uh, deny the Holocaust or uh, or uh, saying something uh, anti-Semitic. Um, I don't agree with that, even though that may be the perception. I think there is a fundamental distinction to be made, as you said, between attacking ideas and religion is a set of ideas and attacking individuals and uh, and groups. But I, I, I don't think it should be a legal one, as it is in many European countries, uh, where in France, for instance, it is – you don't have a blasphemy law in France. So Charlie Hebdo is not, uh, you know, being convicted for blasphemy when they ridicule the prophet, but you do have hate speech laws and you do have a law criminalizing Holocaust denial. So people will be convicted if they deny the Holocaust, and I think, I think, I think that should only be a moral distinction. I don't think it should be a legal one, and I think it's alienating a lot of ordinary Muslims in France because they say, well, we don't have protection in the law against ridiculing what is sacred to us. 
while the Jews, they do have uh, laws protecting their sensibilities. So why have this double standard? I don't agree with the argument that, that you can, that it's not – there's no moral equivalence. But I don't think that you, sh you should make that a legal uh, 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 distinction. And, and, and the problem is that, that the more diverse our societies get in terms of culture, ethnicity and religion, uh, the more groups will come forward and demand the same kind of protection uh, as we have when it comes to anti-Semitic speech. Um, and, 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 and we end up – I mean it's already happening. In fact, in Eastern Europe, uh, they were asked to pass laws against Holocaust denial. They passed them but then they said, well, we have a problem with the crimes of communism. So we have to pass a law criminalizing denial of the crimes of communism. Um, in Ukraine, they have a problem with uh, recognition of their struggle for independence in the 20th century. Uh, so they passed a law criminalizing uh, criticism and denial of the fact that Ukraine had fought for independence in the 20th century. So, so, so you, you, you see even, even in democracies, you see um, uh, governments and parliaments passing laws – um, uh, uh, about a certain version of history, it has it, it, it's 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 just it's just uh, it just doesn't fit a liberal democracy, and and it's very easy for authoritarian regimes to use that approach uh, to uh, suit their needs if they want to silence uh, 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 critical voices. Now, America stands pretty unique in the entire world in, in terms of protecting free speech at a, a much more absolute level. Um, do you in, – in your book, you write about – so you have the European Court of Human Rights, which is I would not really call a court of human rights. It's sort of a court of preferences of Europeans but not never, nevertheless. Uh, they did a professor of Turkish history um, in a book uh, portrayed uh, Muhammad. Um, in in a negative light, apparently, and uh, he was fined in Turkey, which apparently has very very poor free speech laws. Because this week the story came out that a a guy is fake. Did you see the Facebook meme post where he compared the president of Turkey to Gollum from the Lord of the Rings movie? And now the court of yeah. Turkey is going to have to decide if Gollum is a good guy or a bad guy because it's illegal to insult the president of in exactly. Turkey. But the European Court of Human Rights agreed. They uh, they upheld the ruling on the grounds that the book could contain an abusive attack on the prophet of Islam and that believers could legitimately feel that certain passages of the book in question constituted an unwarranted and offensive attack on them. Now, this is a very strange definition of right. In America, this would never happen. Uh, why do you think America stands so unique in the free because speech? Because you have pantheon? the First Amendment, uh, and it, but but it's is the sensibility more free speech? I mean, aside from no, the written I, document, but, I, but I, I would I would say that that on the level of law and the Constitution, uh, America has the best protection in the world of uh, speech. Uh, but but I would say on the level of society and social pressures. I think America may be worse than uh, Europe. There, there, is a, there is a big difference between what you are allowed to say within the limits of the law in the US and what people actually say and what the consequences in social terms are for saying something offensive. You know, with speech codes, with people being fired if they say something offensive on a radio show, that would not happen in Europe. But you would see far more court cases in Europe. Uh, so, so I would say, you know, the, um, uh, the the distance or the difference between the law and 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 actual speech in Europe is narrower than in the United States. Um, uh, I mean, we also now have the, especially in the UK, with with these trigger warnings and safe spaces and microaggressions on campuses where you try to shut down um, speech that you don't like. Well, but, but, I, but, I, but I think it is it, – it's, it's gone further in the US uh, than, than in Europe. We may be – I don't know if we are in for – you know, surprises uh, further down the road. Um, well, things seem to be trending in the wrong direction for the reasons absolutely. you mentioned. I mean, there, there, there's never been so much regulation on speech in the world as we have now. 
Except for and, maybe during the Renaissance or something. Yeah. <laughs> the Catholic I'm Church not, and yeah. things like this. But, but they did not have that many laws. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but you would not be allowed to say a lot of things. That's true. But you have so much regulation now on, uh, on speech. And, and it's bad and, here too. I mean the, the college campuses and everything, it's quite bad here. Yeah. And, and, and the irony is that you would, you would, you, you would have very few, few people standing up and say, I'm against free speech. They would all say, I'm in favor of free speech, but – and then, you know, the funny thing starts. Um, and, and, uh, and it goes back and, – and that's what I think is so wonderful about the First Amendment that, um, that, that you cannot balance the First Amendment against any other law. You, you, you will look at the First Amendment on its own merits and you will not look at, you know – Dignity, uh, democracy, uh, um, racism, uh, and so on and so forth, um, and and that is what what makes uh, America different uh, from other parts of the world. In Europe, um, the right to free speech has to be balanced against other considerations. It may be democracy. People say something undermining democracy, therefore they're not allowed to say it. People say something undermining the, dig the dignity of an in individual, therefore you don't have a right to say it. People say something insulting uh, a specific group, therefore you don't have a right to say it because it undermines democracy uh, and so on and so forth. So, so – uh, and I, I think that is a key distinction that goes all the way back to uh, ancient times um, where, where, you, where you, you have the right to free speech as an individual liberty that you – it's a natural right. And then you have um, um, the right to free speech as one of many rights that has to be balanced according to – uh, what the powers that be want. So it's, it's a right that we give to you but we can also take it back and we can limit it uh, in the way we want if we, if we find it, 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 it necessary. And I think that is a fundamental uh, dichotomy um, and, and we have to, we have to reestablish the right to free speech as uh, a right that we have as individuals and it's not nothing – it's not something that we have received from the government. I have to wonder how much of this desire, especially say in the United States to – the increasing desire to seemingly legislate speech is a product of changing technology and the way that technology enables us to experience each other because you have – you have a situation where you know there it's a big country and there's lots of different norms and different communities have different norms and our little group might think it's okay to tell racist jokes and their little group doesn't and for much of history the things you said never traveled outside of your group unless maybe you had so much money that you could publish books and newspapers and whatever else but now with the internet and with you know global water coolers like twitter what I say can spread around the world um, and so people can see this offense and one of the things that's always struck me as really fascinating is the way that people not only get offended by seeing offensive speech but that they seem to seek it out now in order to make themselves offended. So you'll see articles that will – you know, there'll be some event where like a you know a decision about a, a cop shooting a black teenager will come down and people, journalists or whoever else will go on Twitter and search for racist tweets um, and then republish them. And there seems to be this kind of odd desire to just gather and aggregate the offensive things and make ourselves feel offended and then extrapolate from that to, oh my god, we need to restrict all this speech because there's so much racist speech out there and it's this exactly. very weird, and, and, weird yeah. thing. Yes. Just to give you an example from Denmark, um, a, a, a rather well-known Danish politician, um, I think it was – was it after Charlie Hebdo? No, no, I think it was a little bit earlier. There was a terrorist attack by Islamist uh, radicals and then he, he wrote on Twitter, uh, 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 
we, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Muslims are, tr- are trying uh, – it was after um, uh, an attack on Jews in France, I think. Uh, the Muslims are trying to finish the job that uh, Hitler didn't finish. Um, and uh, he was taken to court and convicted for racist speech. Uh, and um, uh, the, the, the odd thing is that at the time when he made the, this tweet, he had 63 followers and uh, it was retweeted 21 times. When he was convicted in court, it was printed in all the big newspapers in Denmark and broadcast on TV. So, if you really want to, uh, you know, to to um, to make sure that this kind of speech is not being broadcasted, <laughs> you should not have taken him to court. Uh, and it's exactly the same. You say, you know, they they tweet these uh, racist uh, phrases all over the place. Uh, um, and I, you know, I we 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 I think we know from history that uh, the the law is not the most effective tool to fight racism. Uh, it wasn't in Weimar Germany in the 30s. They had hate speech laws. It didn't prevent Hitler from coming into power and um, the Holocaust. In ex-Yugoslavia, uh, you had a law um, criminalizing incitement to ethnic hatred. You could you could go to jail in Yugoslavia for telling an ethnic joke in a restaurant, or waving a, waving a national national flag on a soccer stadium. It didn't prevent uh, you know ethnic wars from breaking out, and people were killed in the tens of thousands. You had a similar law in the Soviet Union. It didn't prevent ethnic wars from breaking out uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union. So, so the law is not a very effective tool. Uh, and I would also say that uh, you know the the laws that we pass in order to protect minorities against baiting could very easily be turned against these minorities if we get another political majority. Just to give you an example from the Netherlands, uh, there is a. Uh, 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 right-wing populist politician uh, by the name Gerd Wilders. It's the second biggest party, I think, in the Netherlands. And he wants to ban the Koran. And he wants to do it using the same hate speech laws that the powers now are using against him and taking him to court for uh, 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 of, of offensive speech. So, so I think it is in the interest also of minorities not to have these laws uh, because they can be turned against them. And if you look at, at history and all social movements for change, women, blacks, uh, homosexuals, whatever it is, uh, uh, um, laws have always been used against them to silence them. Uh, so I think I think I think history tells us that that we should be very careful to pass laws to protect minorities uh, against uh, uh, insults because they can very easily be turned against them. We're recording this uh, about three weeks after the Paris attacks in November of 2015, and so we have a new reason for fear, especially in Western Europe. Um, but of course, we also had a, a shooting in America that seems to be to have ties, at least initially, as we believe, to Muslim activity. Um, and we also have a growth of the college campus free speech thing here, and we have hate law, hate speech laws in Western Europe, and increasing scope of these. It seems like a very a time to be very pessimistic about the future of free speech, the future of self-censorship out of fear in, in Western Europe um, and that it's just going to get worse before it gets better. How do you, how do you respond to that? Or maybe you just fully agree it's pessimistic. No, I'm, you know, I'm an optimist by nature but I'm, I'm also very concerned. Um, uh, I think things are getting worse and, and it sounds maybe like uh, – a contradiction because you never had so much speech on Facebook, uh, social media, and there's a lot of offensive speech there. You know, like a garbage uh, um, can. Um, but I think you know it's not so much public discourse. It's because the things that we used to say in our private homes around a kitchen table they are now out there. Um, 
uh, but 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 uh, as I said earlier, there has never been so much regulation of uh, of speech. And I think, you know, as you mentioned earlier, the forces of globalization are in a way forcing this upon us in a very, you know, aggressive way. So we, we had to make some hard decisions. And, and uh, because, uh, because of communication technology, because of migration, um, most societies in the world will grow more and more diverse. And when you have diverse societies, you will have clashes between different ideas, bet- between different ways of living, between, of, between different uh, religions and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a fact of life and unfortunately um, too many politicians believe that the way to f- save the social peace in this world of growing diversity is to sacrifice freedom. Uh, so we need less diversity of speech in order to promote growing diversity of culture, religion, and ethnicity. And I think it's illogical. Uh, I mean, if you if you really favor a diverse society, you would also have to favor more diversity of speech, because when we are more different, we will express ourselves in different ways, and we will have clashes. So, so we had to re-educate ourselves about, you know, this notion that that in a in a democracy you have many rights. Yeah, you have the right to free speech, the right to freedom of religion, the right to vote for different candidates, the right to freedom of assembly, the freedom of movement. But the only right you should not have is a right not to be offended. But unfortunately, many, many people sincerely believe that they have a right not to be offended. And if they are offended, it's legitimate to tell people to shut up. And they are, in fact, doing it in the name of tolerance. They are saying, you are intolerant when you say something that offends me, so you have to shut up. And that is, in fact, the exactly opposite as the original concept of tolerance, which means the ability to live with things that you don't like, that you hate, uh, and that you... uh, that you, you, I mean, tolerance implies that you, 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 you do not threaten uh, people, you do not, not commit violence in order to silence uh, speech that you don't like, and you don't try to ban it. But, but, but uh, many, many people are doing exactly that in the name of tolerance. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.